Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 438, the Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today, September 21st, 2018. All right, welcome to another show. It's Friday, obviously a big uh, news week, as you'll discover by the end of the show. Before you do anything, to stop and listen I need you to like the show, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook, you see that little thumbs up, that's where you click like. It's best that you do it before you watch the show. Also, share the show. Share it with your friends, your clergy, your bishop, especially your bishop. Uh, do that before you watch the show. It's just best to do it that way. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the show, go to YouTube, click on that little red button that says subscribe, and we'll add you to the people who are instantly notified. When we have a new how do episode. our podcast? Uh, how do our podcast listeners? Is that like YouTube, where you can click uh, something? Do you have? I no. I mean, the podcast people are the the least uh, of those who interact with our show on a like, share, subscribe thing. All they can do is listen because it just shows up in their iPhone or it just shows up on their uh, iPad or uh, radio on their on their in their car. So, <sighs> podcast people, we love you. But uh, if you can find a way to share or love uh, the program, please do. But, uh, and if you want to subscribe to the podcast, go to the show notes in YouTube and click on the link and we'll, it'll add it to your iTunes account. George, lots of news going on out there. Uh, first, this is the healthiest you've looked in about two months. Yes, indeed. I, first week on the job, back to work on Monday morning. Uh, I feel great. I'm getting stronger and better every day. And the doctors believe they've uh, identified what the problem is. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I didn't see the neurologist and the psychiatrist. <laughs> Rather, they've, they, uh, they did some nuclear medicine tests, and they've identified an infection in the bones of my foot and big toe area. Now, that's important because they've been treating the symptoms all these months of infection and fever and blood poisoning. And they would come up with, well, you have this tick bite or well you did this or that well a year and a half ago some of our viewers may remember I would remember the time when the cat ate the o-ring as I was rebuilding the transmission <laughs> we do uh, give a lot they, of information don't we <laughs> well you know I, it, it, it actually uh, encouraged uh, more comments about did my cat live through passing an o-ring through its system now I thought viewers would be more interested did the o-ring survive when I put it on after it threw it up <laughs> back onto the transmission well, in that, uh, I hurt myself. I always hurt myself. You know, I burn myself when I weld, and uh, I hurt. I puncture my body with various things. So I had this infection in my foot, and transmission fluid I thought would, you know, kill all germs. It Only didn't. if you soak it. You can't just dab it. And well, the foot healed up, but inside were planted to the germs of this infection. And when my immune system was uh, on the point of collapse after returning home from GAFCON, that's when my body said, okay, let's have fun, and everything just fell apart. <laughs> so we know what to do, we know how to treat it, and I'm very optimistic uh, about the future. Well, that's good. Yeah, sepsis is not something to play around with. Uh, uh, in many cases, it's fatal, and uh, we just uh, thank God you've survived it, and you're on the band, and now they know the uh, the cause, the source. George, um, a lot of people know you went to, how many different seminaries did you go to? Three? Uh, I only went to uh, one. You went to so Yale, went, you went to Oxford. Where else did you go? I went to Villanova. Villanova, okay. So you went around, So and you were even in England with, with Oxford. So you made a comment last week of how close Blackburn was to Wales. And our listeners over in England <laughs> disagree completely with you. So I thought we'd do a little ge geography here. Um, how far is Blackburn from Wales? Well, it's about, I think it's almost 100 miles. Yeah. yeah so yeah. from my perspective, it's Global. 100 miles <laughs> to my diocesan <laughs> office. You're from it's Florida. right next door. <laughs> distance, Come on now. distance is very subjective, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, what we're talking about is Franklin Graham's going to Blackpool, right. which is a town in the Diocese of Blackburn. And the Bishop of Blackburn, Julian Henderson, who's one of the few conservatives left, 
uh, Gavin has pointed this out, has basically decided to be a mugwump and neither support nor condemn Franklin Graham's crusade. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, maybe Franklin Graham's energy in uh, visiting Blackpool, which is close to Wales, neighboring to Wales, yeah, the diocese, it's close, <laughs> it's, from my it's, perspective. It is. Well, I mean... People live in, you know, cheek to jowl in the, yeah. in the huddled masses of the UK, I'm sure it's... Uh, it's got to be at least six hours drive from the very north of Florida to south of Florida. I well, mean, it's much farther. Maybe eight hours. I mean, you have a different Jackson, perspective. I go, live... Go from yeah. To go to Miami okay. to Key West is three to four hours. Right. My perspective as the state of Connecticut, we are 90 minutes, well, about 60 minutes high and 90 minutes wide uh, by car. And so, you know, we all have different uh, uh, perspectives and our subjective in our distances. So if we kind of are a little off for our English uh, folk, we're sorry. Just where we are. Uh, let's I transition. Mean, me, oh, yeah. Well, you know, when I drive to my uh, doctor, um, I'm driving 40 miles one way. Jeez. And that's the local doctor. So mm -hmm. if you look out my window right now, I see one, two, three, five cattle. Uh, cows. Uh, we ha when I drive to work, I see more livestock than people. But hey, <laughs> it is what it is. The ground is and fertile. Rains, and when it rains, we get the occasional <laughs> alligator popping up. Okay, let's transition transition to some news. Uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit about what's been going on in Africa, uh, especially lately South Africa. Uh, people remember apartheid and all that happened many years ago. And we talked about some of the overreaction now going on at the government and uh, leadership levels where they want to take uh, property back from the white farmers. And now we're seeing discussions about taking property back from the churches. And I'm like, you know, this is not a good time to be a liberal go along to get along church in South Africa because you're going to lose everything real quick, George. Are you saying that the Anglican Church in Southern Africa is a get-along, go-along church, It's Kevin? the only church I've ever heard of down there. <laughs> oh, South African, what's happening is uh, there's a minority party, it only has seven seats in Parliament, called the Economic Freedom Fighters. It's led by Julius Malema, who's a former African National Congress Youth Party leader. They're the radical left, they're Marxists. This is the guy, Tucker Carlson on Tucker Carlson Tonight on Fox News had a little story about this guy a few weeks ago. This is the guy who says, we're not ready to kill the white men yet. Yet. Not yet. Yet. <laughs> uh, they want to take back land held by white farmers, in some cases for over 400 years in the same family, uh, as reparations for what people's ancestors had did. Mm -hmm. And the South African government at the end of apartheid basically said you know we're going to try to help black farmers but it's a willing buyer willing seller program and so if you know if you're willing to sell your land mr farmer we'll help somebody buy it for you and sort of widen the base of the economy and it farming. would be at list price Ma market price market price sorry yeah well the african national congress is hopelessly corrupt the ruling party uh, Jacob Zuma, the last Prime Minister, President's under investigation for fraud and theft and corruption. And corruption, it, it's its really bad. The current President is multi, multi-millionaire several times over, and he's only ever worked in government. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's under a problem because youth unemployment in South Africa is over 50%. And general overall unemployment is about 27%. And the people in the townships, the people who are unemployed, they're looking and said, we've had majority rule for almost 25 years now, and we're worse off now than we were uh, at the end of apartheid. Sure. And so that lets the far left have a breathing space and say, it's all the white man's fault. And actually, they tell you which sort of white man. It's all the Jews' fault. Sounds how familiar, that huh? Works, yeah. How that works, I don't know. But it's the Jews who are training the white men, who are leading the white men to stick it to the black man in South Africa. So the African National Congress, in order to keep its power, has moved, has moved and left because it's got to keep the masses who vote satisfied. And so it started all these 
bills in Parliament to expropriate white land, and now they're sort of taking it. They've had, they just started with a game farm in the north of basically taking it at not market value from an unwilling seller. The new news is that the EFF has now expanded it to churches who should lose their land. Now, now, what, what, does what the kind, of, yeah, what kind of response church? should we get from the Anglican Church? Well, they don't have tumbleweeds in uh, <laughs> South Africa blowing down the street. See, Tabo Makoba, he's the darling, uh, he's the Archbishop of Cape Town. He's the darling, uh, he's, an, he's an acceptable, tame African for the British and American liberals. He, you know, spouts diversity talk, he's PC, he is, you know, far from orthodox in his theology. He speaks out of both sides of his mouth on this issue. Oh, it's a shame that we're back to having laws based on race. In other words, uh, the amount of pigment in your body determines whether or not the state can take your land. Oh, isn't that a shame? But we must right the injustices of the past. So the government, so the South African church, its leadership, it basically is walks in lockstep with the ANC. It has no independent voice. It doesn't speak out against government corruption. And now that's true of other African churches but it's also not the norm. You look at Uganda, you look at Kenya, you look especially at Nigeria and South Sudan. Those are churches that are willing to stand up and say, government, what you're doing is evil. You've got to stop. The next Desmond Tutu is not coming out of South Africa, folks. Uh, I no, I, I, no, that's true. Uh, we get to watch what happens down there. I do predict violence. Um, when you're taking something that does not belong to you at less than market prices, uh, bad things happen, and uh, we'll just get to see what happens. Uh, I first, I, you know, I first went to Zimbabwe uh, in 1998, and I've mm -hmm. been I've been back twice since then. And Zimbabwe went through a similar process to uh, placate the uh, urban unemployed, uh, and to exact revenge on the white farmers, the government took away the white farms. Well, they didn't give them to the farm laborers. They gave them to the generals and the political leaders of the ruling party. And the end result was famine and mass emigration from Zimbabwe because people, if you don't leave, you're going to die. That's right. And the uh, if and to see the South African plan isn't to raise and train a new generation of black commercial farmers with the same expertise as the white commercial farmers. The plan is to take away the land and give it to the politically well connected. And what's going to happen? Famine. Fam yeah, absolutely. I don't even want to talk about what's going to happen. It's bad. Let's uh, transition to news. Um, what well, the joke? The joke in. Yeah. Uh, joke that I, that I remember hearing when I was in Zimbabwe was, what's the difference between Zimbabwe and South Africa? The okay. answer was 20 years. 20 years is right. <sighs> and that's coming true. Yeah, it is. It's 20 years since, I, since my first visit to Zimbabwe and South Africa's headed down that road. Wow. Let's do a compare and contrast. Um, we talk about Justin Welby probably too much. Uh, he's in the news. He's much, uh, much different Archbishop of Canterbury than Roland Williams was. And uh, I was reading one of the comments, and there's a complaint that we talk about Welby too much. And I have to agree. You know, uh, we do talk about him more than we want to. One of the issues is he's very uh, different than Roland Williams. And I don't know if you remember this. This is Frank Griswold and Roland Williams. They could give a a forty five minute talk. And at the end of the 45 minutes, you really didn't know what they they thought, what their opinion well, was on a topic. Well, they were like the horse whisperer. They could sort of, you know, lull you by mm -hmm. into a Zen-like trance of psychobabble. Yeah. But, uh, well, now this is the difference between uh, them and Justin Welby. Justin Welby can get up before a talk or anything else and give you a nice 35-minute speech, and you know exactly what he's thinking that week. And he will try to follow up with actions of what he's thinking. And he'll make sure that Lambeth and the Church of England all try to follow lockstep. And some weeks, he comes off as Gandhi. 
He comes off as this, this character of humility, and we need to be sure that we uh, raise up the poor, that we take money from the wealthy, that we restructure our taxes so that it's fair um, and nobody's left out. And then some weeks, I see him fly into America here, and he attends Wall Street, Trinity Wall Street. He goes to all these rich churches here in America, uh, collecting his money, and doesn't visit one poor church at all. And I'm like, well, now he's coming off as Gordon Greco. And I, I'm trying to contrast who is the real Justin Welby. Who is he, George? I don't know, Kevin. Don't know. Uh, I don't well, know what's then, in then there's the third. A... Hold on. Then there's the third Justin Welby, who is basically the shadow of Pope Francis. Yes, yes. Yeah. It's, a me too. Uh, it's the Me Too movement, me, me but too, a different <laughs> Me Too movement. What a, uh, Justin Welby had probably the worst week of uh, any Archbishop of Canterbury since Thomas of Becket had at his uh, <laughs> his death rank, has, his, has his tenure cut short at Canterbury Cathedral. Well, the it wasn't that clever of a, a, a line, Kevin, but uh, it was I'm good. glad you supported <laughs> In my uh, attempted humor, Welby gave us Welby gave an interview and then a speech at the trade union conference, and he came and he he spouted Marxist mm -hmm. uh, economics policy prescriptions, radical socialist, soak the rich, high tax high taxes on the corporations, inheritance taxes. Uh, raising up the uh, giving grants of money to twenty five year olds. Um, basically an economically illiterate uh, policy that will destroy just as surely the British economy as the set plans to expropriate South African farmers will. But, but, and remember he attacked Amazon.com as being an evil capitalist predator and he attacked zero, zero contract hours. Well, the church, the, the press, the church press first and the secular press woke up and reported the next day that, oh, one of the biggest assets held by the Church of England is Amazon.com stock, and they're not going to sell. And then, oh, look at all these advertisements from cathedrals for zero contract jobs. Mm. And the press had a field day with Welby of just saying, what an idiot. I mean, he doesn't do his homework. Not only is his policy prescription stupid, the man just its not up to the job. Well, and this was said in The Times and The Guardian and in The Spectator, you know, stuff that you and I say week in, week out. This was this actually appeared in the secular press even nastier than you and me. Well, for the first time that I've ever heard this from anybody in, in church leadership, you know, Church of Canterbury or Pope, he decided that the government was the solution and the church was not the solution. He said, let's take the food banks out of the churches and give it to the government because the government can do it better. And I'm like, game over. Oh, uh, you, that'll that, work. I mean, uh, <laughs> do any of our viewers uh, rely upon the Veterans Administration for health care? I'm sure you know how wonderful that system is. That's government health care for you. And if you want that... You know, I bury people at my church who rely upon the VA healthcare system because it's run by the government. It's as corrupt as it gets. And this is why Justin Welby ends up in our news program every once in a while, like every other week, because of, you know, stuff that he, it, he's not representing the church. He's not representing the gospel. He's not representing the Beatitudes or the teaching of Christ in any way, shape, or form except the Gandhi form. Well, Comrade Welby... Uh, a week after, 10 days after uh, sticking it to capitalism, where does he go? He visits the United States. And this weekend, he's going to preach at Trinity Wall Street after having been at St. Michael's and All Angels down in Dallas. Now, he may surprise us, Kevin. He may say to the people at Trinity Wall Street, you evil, cruel capitalists, you must turn over all your assets immediately to the government so that the government can open food banks and do all this work. Or now, he'll do what he's done in the past and just suck up and try to get money for the Compass Rose Society and other slush funds he operates. Let's back up, and I know you know this, how does Trinity Wall Street get its money? 
it owns the land <laughs> underneath the skyscrapers in downtown Manhattan that was gifted to it by, I believe, Queen Anne mm -hmm. 300 odd years ago. And it survives on rents and investments. So Doesn't if we go back to his tuck speech, it is incumbent upon Wall Street to Trinity Wall Street to completely empty its coffers of these properties and not make money off them, right? Of course, because we need to reform how inheritance and corporations pass on assets to future generations. That's what I want to hear, Welby. I want to hear that from the pulpit next week. Well, you know, Welby is preaching that you and me, Kevin, shouldn't be able to leave our money to our children. Well, if we, if I had money to leave to my children, we shouldn't be able to do it because the government should get its cut, which would be the majority, to take care of its pressing social needs. And that should apply to corporations and trusts as well. And what does he do? He goes to Trinity Wall Street to give his annual suck-up speech, send me more money so I can have more meaningless, fruitless conferences that do nothing. Send me to Dallas uh, to uh, hobnob with the wealthy social climbers at St. Michael's and All Angels so I can uh, show off to the world. Man, this is simony, Kevin. This is so fun. This is... This is <laughs> This is abhorrent in a Christian leader. Does he go? Is he going to Harlem? Is he going to Gary, Indiana? Is he going to, oh, Peddler's Knob, Tennessee? Peddler's. To, no, see the, this is... to see the poor and the lost and the downtrodden, all these people that his socialist policies he thinks are going to help. No, he hangs out with the plutocrats. Yeah. And do you think he's going to insult them? Well, he might. He might a Maybe bit. I'm wrong. Uh, I'm wrong all the time. No, so let uh, me. I hope I'll be surprised. Uh, no, a little, a little liberal guilt goes a long way. You know, Justin Welby uh, suffers from white privilege itis, and uh, you know this is what you you get when he walks around um, trying to make his own gospel. Let's talk about whales. Look, it, oh, I think you know before I before I finish, yeah, you know, and this ties into something we're going to do later with the Catholics. Uh, Welby's latest thing is global warming, plastics. Um, cardinal Muller, one of the German cardinals, a conservative one, uh, said the problem, you know, he, he had a little retort to something the Pope was saying, but it equally applies to Welby, which is the problem with greenhouse gases is not the work of the church. The pro work of the ch problem for the church is sin. And to to focus on issues that are second level to your salvation is not the primary work of the church. And what is Justin Welby now picking up? He's following the Pope. He's mini-me to Pope Francis. Yeah. Uh, for, for those of our viewers under the age of 50, that's a reference to uh, Austin Powers, uh, which was a series of movies in the 90s. Um, the, he, he's Francis's mini-me on social issues. And look, look how well it's gone for Francis. Yeah. Or Al Gore. <laughs> or Francis. No, I mean, there, there's humor in watching it because uh, it's not like he's the first one to make these mistakes. The problem is he's repeating history. Uh, he's just becoming a, another fool on the pulpit. Uh, Christianity is about the individual, not about uh, government taxation, not about government policies on, on climate change. If you change the individuals, you will get what you need in the end. Kevin, I do have a soft spot for Al Gore. It's I have to tell you that. The only time Drudge ever linked to anything I've ever done was a story about Al Gore selling uh, some fund or pro something or other to the Church of England's pension fund. Mm -hmm. And it was like December 31st, just January 1st, about 10, 12 years ago, so there's no news. And Drudge links to this story. And it shut down the Church of England newspaper's website. I think they had like quarter of a million hits in one day. So Al Gore, you're like Catherine Jeffrey Shore. You were the gift who kept on giving for me in the tough times of 10 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Politics. Um, let's talk a little bit about whales. Uh, we gave a little information two weeks ago. What's the update? The update is, uh, in addition to what we reported about the bishops going ahead with gay marriage, we've had additional reports about how they went about and did it. Mm -hmm. 
And one of the exciting things about the Church in Wales is it's the mendacity of its leaders. I'm speaking of Archbishop Barry Morgan, who's no longer there, but Archbishop Davies, the current Archbishop. Well, they invited a primate to talk about gay marriage. And who did they invite? The primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church. Now, they don't want to in any way uh, guide the deliberations because the governing, it's episcopally led but synodically governed. All archbishops are neutral. And yes. they're just trying to and lift up the so church to do what the church should so do best. Let's invite somebody mm -hmm. who can speak to us and help us on this issue. So they invite Mark Strange, who was one who was the nasty fellow in charge of this, uh, the primus of the Scottish Episcopal Church, to give his version of how the loving and kind and deliberative process in the Church of Scottish Episcopal Church led to them to do gay marriage. Now, a fellow named Dean Roberts, a priest from the Diocese of Monmouth, when they had question time, got up and said, well, I see we have a combative, outspoken advocate for gay marriage. Where's the Nicholas other side. Yeah, that's right. Where's the other side? Oh, you don't need to hear the other side. You only need to hear how lovingly the Scots did it. Now, these are the people who rig elections, uh, the Scottish Episcopal Church, well, well, they took, they took it. No, well, they took over a diocese. If you remember, yeah, they correctly. took over yeah. the conservative diocese. They took it over and they appointed a pro-gay, uh, pro-gay marriage woman priest. Mm -hmm. uh, when this was the one diocese who voted against all of that, they decided to show them we're going to appoint somebody totally antithetical to your belief system because we need diversity. Now we're not going to give up our jobs. No. no, no. But when a conservative position comes, we're going to fill it with one of our yes men, yes women. Before we it's leave, okay. uh, 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 yeah, who haven't we been not kind or mean to? We haven't hit the Cathedral of San Francisco yet. Uh, I'm, I'm, right now, people are watching this video, and I'm, I'm sure it's not copywritten because who would copyright this? But you're watching trees walk into a church down the main aisle of a cathedral right now. Um, George, is this some uh, druid uh, practice that I'm not aware of that goes on in cathedrals? Well, we are talking about Grace Church and Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, uh -huh. so you can assume that there may be a druidic juridical element in this. <laughs> However, I have been reliably informed that the traditionalist movement within druidism has Denied filed it. objections, <laughs> saying that this is cultural appropriation of the crazies in San Francisco of their ancient faith. What's, they had an ecumenical slash interfaith uh, celebration of the environment. And so they had this procession and you can see some orthodox, you can see oh, it's either an Oompa Loompa or it's a Muslim woman. She's about four foot ten inches tall. And immediately in back of her is this man in a tree outfit, where walking on stilts, but he has pant legs over the stilts, dressed as a tree. And then in the background, you have other uh, people dressed as trees. And Jeff Walton was the one who alerted the world to this, of our good friend and sometimes contributor to this program. And he basically said, this reminds him of the Lord of the Rings and the March of the Ends. <laughs> Wow. Now, Thank you for, for a me, white wizard to show up, or a gray wizard at least. Now, Kevin, I do have one, but now, so I guess I'm not really that, that perturbed because, you know, Grace Cathedral, that's the home of the labyrinths, the home of Gaia worship, the home of this and that. I mean, this is, if this, this isn't shocking to me, it's entertaining. What was shocking to me, the bishop, Mark Andrus, who, who led the, was at the tail end of the procession, he had a social faux pas for clergy. The poor man has these transition glasses uh -oh. that go from sunshine yep. outside, clear inside, mm -hmm. never come directly outside into the church because the look of having dark sunglasses as you walk down the aisle immediately in the back of a tree just reinforces this event that you are stoned, not in your mind. <laughs> San Francisco. I don't know how Welby didn't get invited to that. That's what he should have went to first. Oh, well. Hey, it's been a fun show this week. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 438.
which may very well be the last one once the attorneys from various people contact us, of Anglican Unscripted.